Hey guys and girls, welcome to this week's episode of Tuesday Night Live. Thanks a lot for tuning in and uh, having me as a part of your Tuesday night evening. So, um, and we are live. So, um, topic to talk about today, uh, kind of mix things up a little bit. Um, different today because I don't have anyone around me. I feel like I've had people with me every week for the last few weeks uh, for the Facebook Lives. Um, but this week I have something I've been wanting to talk about this for a while. I want to address it. I want to talk about why we live in a scam, why I'm so weird with what I say and bring it up with charts and stats and all of that sort of stuff. So I will give you guys a website to go to after this to go and research and refer back to any of the sort of charts that I was um, uh, referencing this evening. And um, yeah, I'll have lots of charts and, and stuff like that today. Uh, I've only got one news article uh, today, which I just got. And uh, whilst everyone's loading online and, and jumping online, there's um, a couple of things that have happened in the world in the last week. I think it was actually two weeks ago when I had Jeremy on here, or last week actually, and Jeremy said, uh, Nathan, the uh, the queen's gonna die, and she died, and uh, or allegedly died anyway. And um, interesting world we live in. And uh, I just did a podcast talking about uh, touching on that a little bit. I'll probably get into that in more detail at some other time. I'm not going to touch on that today, but there is interesting thoughts on that as well. Um, there's only one article that I've got here. One of um, the community just sent it over to me. I saw it on my phone just before we went live. I thought it was interesting. News.com article. It reads, up to 5% of Goldman Sachs workers to get the sack. And uh, the big banking firm is firing as many as 2,350 workers uh, after profits tanked off the back of weak profits. <laughs> There's really good uh, grammar there. As much as as many as 2,350 workers after profit tanked off the back of weak profits. There we go. Um, it goes on to read, global banking firm Goldman Sachs is preparing for round of mass sackings as the economic downturn takes its toll. The multinational bank plans to cut between five, one to five percent of its staff who are deemed the lowest performing workers across all levels of the company. That's between four, 470 and 2,350 workers out of the bank's 47,000 strong workforce. In July, CNBC flagged the layoffs were on the horizon. And earlier on Tuesday, New York Times reported the Goldman Sachs was introducing the measure amid tough market conditions. The now rumoured layoffs could happen as soon as next week. The inside source of the publication told that there has been a two-year gap between job cuts. Goldman would not, would most likely ease into the layoffs. As a result, a number of employees getting the chop are expected to be on the lower end of its 1-5% to 5 target, likely around several hundred people. Goldman Sachs is well known for routinely cutting its staff before bonuses have been paid out. And uh, at the end of the year, the company paused the practice during the last two years of the uh, alleged illness. So interesting uh, to see that we have banks now saying that they've got bad profits and uh, things are falling apart. Um, and I, I think, you know, you can't have moves made, like moves can't be made without some sort of reaction. Every action has a reaction. Um, what we are seeing is going to be the biggest recession or depression the world has ever seen unless they keep printing. Right? And um, tonight we're going to go into a lot about what happened. I've got so many pages, so many charts, there's literally pages and pages of charts. We want to run through these charts uh, and we'll go through them together and um, put a lot of dots together. And this is how I come up with my random theories, my creative thinking. Uh, by understanding the data, understanding the actions that are being played out there in the marketplace, whether it be interest rates going up, whether it be interest rates going down, whether it be policy changes and uh, fundamentals of the society that we live in. So the first one here is just a little um, article. This is actually just an article here. I think it's an article. Um, it's just an article actually. I'll give a bit of a background. So, what the fuck happened in 1971 and why the fuck matters so much right now? This here is an article here. Um, actually, this could come from a website. It could be the actual page. But let's get straight into it and see what happened. So, what happened? What do you guys think happened in 1971? Maybe put a little note below and um, uh, what's that? Um, 
<laughs> I hope everyone's doing well. Thanks for the comments. What do you think happened in 1971 and why does it matter? Throw us a comment below. Let us know before we get into it. This article goes on to say the temptation to print money, money is the greatest temptation in the world. If you ventured into the crypto Twitter this year, you may have seen a tweet from the meme account, what the fuck happened in 1971, which is what we're going to touch on today. Created in March, the account posts numerous times a week, a fast growing fan base of 10,000 followers, a typical post a feature the graph that shows how inequality has grown in recent years, inflation has skyrocketed and how ordinary people are being priced out of house or stocks due to low wage growth. Somewhere on the chart, there will be a little arrow pointing at 1971, which highlights when the rot set in and inevitably, invariably pose the questions like what the fuck happened to wages in 1971 or a chart showing ever widening political polarization. What the fuck happened in 1971 that led to such a divergence in political thought? Its followers noticed a similar phenomena con contribute to the meme by tagging them in. This week, someone posted a New York Post article showcasing the decline in happiness of lower socioeconomic statuses and white adults since early 1970s, asking, gee, I wonder what the fuck happened in 1971. So if you have a look at these charts, everything was, yes, you would be correct. I've got a few guys here. Uh, <laughs> a lot of you guys, you guys are right on the money, guys. You guys are right on the money. Uh, hey, Steve, how you doing? Hey, Scott, uh, dollars, yes, money changed. Mark said, removed off the gold standard. Zach said the US dollar removed. Came off the gold standard. Tricky Dicky, yep, yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> President Nixon, Tricky Dick Nixon, um, turned the petrodollar, gold standard's gone. So when we look here and we can start looking at charts, you'll start seeing a bit of a trend and a pattern that's occurred. So... Uh, the What the Fuck Happened website in 1971 website suggests that all these uh, dis disparate effects are connected with the President Richard Nixon calling time on the Brenton Woods financial system, which led to the value of the world's reserve currency, the US dollar, to gold. The gold standard, as it is known, underperformed the finance global finance from 1944 when the World War II allied nations, including the US, Canada, Western European nations, Australia, Japan, negotiated the rules of an international monetary system with fixed exchange rates between the currencies. This took place at a hotel in Brenton Woods, New Hampshire. At the time, the US controlled two-thirds of the world's gold and insisted the system was based on gold and the US dollar. The system meant that the theory you could redeem $35 for one ounce of gold, although actual fact it was illegal for US citizens to hold gold between 1933 and 1974. Interesting year that 1933, and interesting the fact that um, it was illegal to own gold between 1933 and 1974. So much so that that's why, if you look in Australia, things like gold sovereigns, which was the um, the sort of UK sort of system of um, currency, which you had Australian gold sovereigns and you had UK some gold sovereigns and whatnot, the, they, a lot of them were missing because people had to hand them in and they were burnt down, melted and all that sort of stuff um, because they basically rolled everyone and said it was illegal to have this gold. And that went on for 50 years or so. And it was illegal to have real currency at that period of time. Uh, the gold standard, as it is known, um, yeah, we've read that. The system meant the theory could redeem that. Um, the government, again, ran into money trouble backing the currency with the gold in the late 1960s and printing too much money to pay for things like the Vietnam War and various welfare programs, which the, was rationale for Nixon killing the system in August 15th, 1971. So it actually just passed its 51st year. And 2021, which was last year, right smack bang into the middle of the Great Reset, um, we saw, you know, the 50-year anniversary there. So interesting timing as well. Yeah, but that was a good thing. The effects of, the, of this are con contested, to say the least. The International Monetary Fund, the IMF, for example, suggests the fears at the time that the move away from gold would bring an era of rapid growth and the end to where misplaced. In fact, the transition to floating exchange rates was relatively smooth and it was certainly timely. Flexible exchange rates made it easier for economies to adjust more expensive oil when the price suddenly started going up from October 1973. So we start looking at it and going, well, did the value of the oil go up or did the currency start losing its value and inflation kicking in? 
for many traditional Keynesian economic, <laughs> economists, leaving the gold standard behind has provided governments with the flexibility to use activist monetary and fiscal policies to respond to or prevent ec economic crises. For example, without the Federal Reserve's unlimited quantitative easing program money printing this year, the economy may have fallen into such a deep hole the US may never have climbed out of it. And Greece's inability to inflate itself out of a sovereign debt crisis in the years after the global financial crisis was a part of the reason it had to embrace the crippling austerity measures. Surveys of mainstream economists suggest that 9 out of 10 think returning to the gold stand that would be a disaster. Well, it would be a disaster because we would lose everything that we have in life. But then you would realise that your house prices wouldn't go up. If you go back to look at charts, right, I encourage everybody to look at charts before 1971 and look at what happened to property prices for all the years prior to 1971. And you will see that the property prices remained pretty flat, nothing happened, but it was when they de-pegged it, that's when real growth started happening. So we've really only had a debt-based Ponzi scheme for the last 51 years, and that's when we've started seeing these big absorbent booms that we've seen over the recent years. No leaving the gold standard was a disaster, but what the fuck 1971 tells us is a different story. It showcases various graphs highlighting the fact that 1971 onwards, productivity increased while wages in flatline. GDP surged, but the, but the share going workers plummeted. House prices went through the roof, leading to American savings becoming ex inextricably tied to home values. It suggests that around the world, episodes of hyperinflation increased, currencies crashed more frequently, and there was a spike in the number of banking crises. The personal savings rate fell off a cliff. Incarceration went through, up through by a factor of five. Divorce rates shot up, and the number of people in the late 20s living with their parents increased exponentially. Most horrifyingly at all, all the numbers of the number of lawyers quadrupled. Right. So let's have a look at this. In 1971, the amount of lawyers quadrupled, <clears throat> created a market there. Anyway, um, economists have got it all wrong. Fiat is where are we here? The site and the Twitter account was founded by former 3D graphics designer Ben Pretense and Bitcoin podcaster Heavily Armed Clown, all knows, also known as Colin from the Bitcoin Echo Chamber. Both live on live on the east coast of the us and met with pre prentice pitched himself as a guest on colin's podcast prentice discovered bitcoin in 2017 and fell into a deep austrian economics rabbit hole that's a strand of heterodox economics beloved by gold bugs such suggests keynesian economists have got it all wrong fiat worth as paper and silver and gold is the answer although hugely influential among among bitcoiners Austrian economics has shunned by mainstream economists and frequently criticised for lacking scientific rigour and not relying enough on mathematical models and macroeconomic analysis. Austrian economics... I can go through all this, right? I feel like I'm tongue-twisting over so much words here, right? I will post all this onto Birchfeed. If you are not on Birchfeed, <clears throat> go to birchfeed.com. It is for free, um, and I'll post the links up there later on today. Um but basically, let's go through some of these other parts of this article. Rising inequality is the result. The most obvious effect of moving away from the gold standard is the ability for governments to print as much money as their hearts decide. As Colin puts it, the temptation to print money is the greatest temptation in the whole wide world. To illustrate how this harms individuals, pre pre printers use the analogy of a pie representing the economy with slices representing the money in circulation. As we are printing more money, all we're doing is taking the existing slices and making them smaller and smaller and smaller. Each unit now has worth less. Nothing new has been created. You still have the same pie, you still have your same slice of the pie, but it is smaller than it was before. That's a very true um, view of that, right? When you look at your dollar, your dollar is just losing its value. You still have the dollar, but it doesn't feed you as much as what it used to. Collins says this results in people trying to store their wealth in other ways, which has resulted in a runaway asset price inflation since 1971. Surprise, surprise. 
When money is debased, it loses value over time. People store their wealth in assets, he says. That is why it's common financial wisdom to diversify your assets, to invest in stock markets, and to invest in bonds, to invest in gold, to buy a house. The more assets you own, the better off you are in the long run because all those assets are going to increase in price because of inflation. Let's clap for this bloke, right? Because finally we have some with a bit of sense out there. Um, the net effect is massive increase in economic inequality because the wealthier you are, the larger the percentage of wealth you can afford to hold in a liquid volatile assets. While working Joes, however, the median household net worth of America is 97,000 need to devote most of their dollars to rent and food and insurance and have a larger share of capital and depreciating assets like cars. This system is very, very much to tilted towards the wealthy, says Prentice. A very wealthy person would hold up to 80 to 90% of their wealth in business interest and equities, right? And those inflate. This is where the money of the wealthy, but this is the money of the wealthy, but the access to the assets are almost nil for the poorest, which is why I talk about property being such a grandest asset because you can then not just buy the piece of real estate. The thing that I like about property so much is that you have the property which gets inflated in time. Your debt is stuck at a point which is fixed in value. Let's say you've got a 200 grand loan and a 200 grand property. The property might go to a million bucks, but your debt is still $200,000. It becomes worthless over time. Not only does your property value go up in value, but your uh, your rent goes up in value as well. So it's a very, very important tool. If you understand how the money works, then you um, then you understand how um, uh, you, you understand how the whole system works and everything that plays on top of it. Um, this system would be less of a problem if wages had kept up, kept up with inflation. While average hourly wages in the US has roughly increased in line with CPI, that's just one way to measure inflation. There, one of the most telling charts on the site shows the number of working hours to buy a single unit on the S&P 500 has increased to an all-time high of 126 hours today, up from an average of 30 hours since 1860. So we'll go through those charts, but you can start seeing that every chart around the world has gone nuts since 1971 and that's where the growth has occurred and that's because they've hijacked the money and the currency that people are using so um uh just having a look here um, um Cool. Keep all the questions coming through. Um, if you can't get access to the Birch Feed website, just send an email to my team um, requesting how to get access to Birch Feed. You can send it at admin at beinvestor.com.au and my team will assist you in getting in there. Um, but I'll, I'll have the articles, I'll post these articles tonight and then the, the team, when, once you get into Birch Feed, they'll get onto that for you. Depending on how deep down the rabbit hole you have you want to go, there are ramifications everywhere. Colin explains there is an economic calculation that can be for, be performed normally, whereby as capital is accumulated in bank savings accounts, interest rates come down. Then people are more likely to borrow money and go out and try and engage in new productive ventures. He says creating new money money and artificially suppressing the central bank interest rate is distorting that economic calculation. And that's why I always talk about it. I'm so excited by it because I understand that this is a banker's game. The property game is just the asset that plays on the field. But the game is designed around the bankers. It is a system that is designed. And if you can understand how that system works, you can use it to your advantage. You can take advantage of that system and clear the bank out. It says our crazy financial system is the reason hugely profitable companies like Apple still borrow billions of dollars to buy their own stock. Why would they buy, borrow so much money when they can just use have to use to pay interest to, in order to buy back their own stuff? The answer is the replacement cost of assets is higher than the replacement cost of the capital. When you understand when that works, just, just repeat that, that's where the whole paradigm shifts. When you when they borrow money, they then have to use they then have to use to pay interest to buy other their own stuff back. The answer is the replacement cost of assets is higher than the replacement cost of our capital. The capital is worthless. It was created from nothing. When you realize there is no value to money, the debt doesn't matter, right? Uh, so the money is debt. The debt, the money to be put into the system from day one was only ever debt. It was created. It's meant to be paid back to the system. So this system just keeps printing on itself until we have runaway levels of inflation, which is where we're heading to, to our next cycle of where we're heading into. 
Uh, like the famous chapter of Free Economics uh, that linked Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision uh, to access the abortion in 1970s, a decrease in crime two decades later, they are not discounting some less intuitive ramifications. We believe that a lot of second, third and fourth order effects happen as ripple effects that happen outwards of monetary policy. When you have, when we look at things like obesity, right, and you say this is not related to the end of the gold standard, are you sure? Because people have to eat a whole lot more subsidised food than they did 60 years ago. And in America, the number of subsidised crops are sugar and corn. So when you think about how crops are created, when you start looking at food chains, when you start breaking down the fabric of society, there's lots of things that have changed, right? You didn't see fat people going back 50 years ago. Every person walking down the street, they're eating the food, they're poisoning themselves with certain types of things that they're putting in their body, even the, the nice vegetables and fruit that you get from the shops and meat that you get from Woolworths. Like it's full of chemicals and pumped up full of GMOs. Um, they've distorted the parameters for profits and companies and corporations. They now believe the system has become so distorted it is no longer genuine capitalism. Collins points to the fact that 52% of adults who are now forced to live at home with their parents instead of buying their own wealth, buying a house and starting their own families. You can't afford to do any of these things and just look at the system that exists and you say, this is broken, right? You've always believed in capitalism, but now you're seeing the system that they called capitalism is broken. But Ben, I, ben and I post that this is not capitalism, this is something completely different. This is social monetarism. Uh, although there is some pretty cool obvious, ob some pretty ob obvious drivers of the 100 days of protest and riots in America following the death of George Floyd, rising inequality has played a big role, says pretense. I absolutely think so. I think that people get out of the streets when things are going well. Um, people are frustrated because they don't feel the system is working at all and they work their whole lives with crappy jobs. Maybe they're wrong. Um, there's lots here to read. There's lots here to read. I don't want to just be reading to you a website. So um, it's... Uh... <laughs> here we go. I'm going to get into the charts. I'm going to get into one last little thing, which is an important question that I know that a lot of you guys will probably be questioning. Um, let's have a look here. Let's park this one to the side. I'll post the link in. You can read it all yourself. This one here um, is an article, well, this is from the Office of the Historian. Yeah. So this is um, note to reader, milestones in the, history, in the history of US foreign relations has been retired as no longer maintained, blah, blah. Nixon and the end of the Brenton Woods system, 1971 to 1973. On August the 15th, 1971, President Trick Dick Nixon announced that his new economic policy program called to create a new prosperity without war. Let's have a little water, guys. Let's have a little water. Known colloquially, colloquially as the Nixon shock, the initiative marked the beginning of the end of the Brenton Wood system for fixed exchanges rates established at the end of World War Two. Secretary of the Treasury, um, John Connolly on that day, President Nixon announced a new economic policy on August 15th, 1971. Under the Brenton Woods system, the external values of foreign currencies were fixed in relation to the US dollar, whose value was uh, in turn expressed in gold and congressionally set a price of $35 an ounce. By 1960, surplus of US dollars caused foreign aid, military spending and foreign investment threatened this system. As the US did not have enough gold to cover the volume of dollars in worldwide circulation at the rate of $30 per ounce, as a result, the dollar was overvalued. Presidents JFK and Lyndon Johnson adopted a series of measures to support the dollar and sustain Brenton Woods. It's kind of a conspiracy to question whether the JFK guy was there to help keep the system together in returning it back to a gold standard. There's an executive order 111. O zero zero one 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 o one I think it is executive order which they say that that's why he got shot dead due to the fact that he was attempting to uh, change the course of the monetary system which was not something he should have been playing with. Um, 
Foreign investment, disincentives, restrictions on foreign lending, efforts to stem official outflow of dollars, international monetary reform and cooperation with other countries, nothing worked. Meantime, traders in foreign exchange markets believed that the dollar's overvaluation would one day compel the US government to devalue it, proved increasingly inclined to sell dollars. This resulted in periodic runs on the dollar. It was just as much, it was just such a run on the dollar, along with mounting evidence that the overvalued dollar was undermining the nation's foreign trading position, which prompted President Nixon to act. On August 13, 1971, Nixon convened a meeting his top economic advisers, including a Secretary of Treasury, John Connolly, and the Office of Management and Budget Director, George Schultz, the Camp David, at the Camp David Presidential Retreat to consider a program of action. Notably, the absent from the meeting was the Secretary of State, William Rogers, and President's Assistant, National Affairs Minister Henry Kissinger. After two days of talks, the evening of August the 15th, Nixon announced his new economic policy as an address to the nation on the change on the challenge of peace, ascertaining that the process in bringing an end to the US involvement in the war in the Vietnam meant that at the time the Americans could turn their minds to the challenges of a post-Vietnam world. Nixon identified a threefold task. We must create more and better jobs. We must stop the cost of living. We must protect the dollar and the tax of international monetary speculators. To achieve these first two goals, he proposed tax cuts and a 90-day freeze on price and wages. To achieve the third, Nixon directed the suspension of the dollar's convertibility to gold. He also ordered that the extra 10% tariffs be levied on all dutiable imports by the suspension of the gold's dollar convertibility. This measure was intended to induce the United States made a trading partners to adjust the value of their currencies upward and to level the trade barriers downward to allow more inputs from the United States. A success at home, Nixon's speech shocked many abroad who saw it as an act of worrisome unilateralism. The assertive manner in which the Connolly conducted ensuring exchange rate negotiations with his foreign counterparts did little to ally such concerns. Nevertheless, after months of negotiations, the group of 10, G10. So when you think about the G20 summits and all that, the group of 10, G10, industrialized democracies agreed to set a fixed exchange rates centered on a devalued dollar. In December 1971, Smithsonian agreement, although characterized by Nixon as the most significant monetary agreement in the history of the world, the exchange rates established the Smithsonian agreement did not last long. 15 months later, in February 1973, Speculative market pressure led to further devaluation of the dollar and another set of exchange parties. Several weeks later, the dollar was yet subjected to heavy pressure in financial markets. However, this time there would be no attempt to shore up the Brenton Woods. In 1973, the G10 approved an arrangement wherein six members of the European, European community tied their currencies together and jointly floated against the US dollar. The decision that effectively signaled the abandonment of the Brenton Woods fixed the exchange rate system in favour of the current system of floating exchange rates. So when you look and read this article, I'll post this in Birch Feed as well, you start seeing and questioning things that we would see today occurring, that it's a challenge of peace. So there was a three things. Let's go back and read it. Um, two days of talks, Nixon announced his new economic, the new economic policy in an address to the nation, the challenge of peace. Um, to get out of the world war. We must create better jobs and we must stop the cost of living. This is why we are doing these sort of things. Now, when we look at the news, we have, you know, we have a virus, we have climate change, we have all these certain things that are impacting people's lives. Um, you should be questioning what policy is being passed, what um, what is the bigger mess that's there behind the scenes that we can't see? Because everybody that was watching this on the date would have been, yeah, President Nixon is the best guy out. Henry Kissinger, he's the best guy out. Reality of it is, is that the world changed because of that, because of the actions that these powerful people took um, to hide the fact that the US dollar had gone bankrupt. The US should have gone bankrupt in 1971, but instead they rolled the rest of the world and created a bigger Ponzi scheme. So that currency, if we go back to the date of when the currency was created, between 1933 and 1971, there was a currency, <clears throat> it was a gold-backed dollar that was in place at that point. It was different before 1933, um, before it failed in 1933. And then it failed again in 1971. That was about 40 years. 
a currency died in 2008, 2005. It's died many times over the years, but it's, on, it's in palliative care on a dialysis machine at the moment, and our currency is completely screwed up. And as we see it die and falter, they have nothing to come back with this is. This is going to be connected to some sort of digital currency in the future, but it's a very, how do they do it? There's lots of moving parts that, you know, I think we're going to see a lot more problems in the, in the, in the years to come. So that takes me to this website. And this website is what I really want to talk about tonight. And I want to go through all these charts because it's very, very important that you start seeing these trends. These trends have occurred for 51 years now. It's data, it's real data. It's over all these years, it doesn't get talked about um, out there on the news. You wouldn't see the news talk about it because the news is merely just a propaganda outlet for those that are controlling the minds of the people out there. So um, I question everything that is happening in the world right now. I question the movements that you know certain entities are making, the central banks are making, the governments are making. I really, really question everything that's going on. So um, here's the growth in productivity and compensation since 1948 uh, to 2017. So this is an old chart here. Um, you can see that it was tied together all the way up. So people were uh, being paid in line with what they were producing. And then over, since 1971, it sort of split and compensation remained pretty stagnant, but the pro productivity went up because then they could manipulate because it wasn't attached to anything. And that manipulated the amount of productivity they could get out of someone. Um, this one here on the bottom is the real GDP uh, and wages and trade uh, policies in the US from 1947 to 2014. You can see here uh, everything was tied together and you've got real GDP up there. You've got you know, the different parts of the GDP. Why does it look so different after 1971? What happened there? Um, so if we have a look here, you look at the income gains which have uh, changed since 1971. Why did we have a split off here? Why do we have the upper end of town and we have the lower end of town here why did that change and we're going to have a look here what have we got here income growth from 1917 to 2012 what happened with what have we got here the, the bottom 90 percent so if we have a look there the bottom the bottom 90 percent they're having growth through the i'd imagine through the industrial revolution the creation of houses electricity all that sort of stuff and in 1971 it stopped. The growth stopped there. But then we started seeing here the top 1%. What year was that? In 1980, 1990, 2000, you started seeing the really wealthy getting a lot more wealthy because they had the access to the tools. If we didn't have, if the bankers didn't have the table for us to play at, we wouldn't be able to play this game. Um, we're very blessed to have these dodgy banking systems in place. We are very blessed to have a corrupt world that we are born into and live into, um, just due to the fact that if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have a table to play at. It's understanding that, that, the game, that this game exists, and it is important to understand how do you play the game, how do you get ahead, because savers are losers. Sometimes people get upset and they're like, Nathan, what do you mean savers aren't losers? You need to save money in order to get ahead. Savers are losers because they have their money, and it keeps getting devalued. The real winners are those that have assets. So the assets are going up, the assets are bringing in power. But then the real leverage in that is if you have debt, the debt is becoming worthless. So the power of being able to leverage in this system is important. If this system didn't work on leverage and it started to deflate, the whole system would implode. So there will be a day of judgment for this. It's like having a big party and uh, you know, just keep drinking the alcohol and you know, party, party, party. One day it will come back to bite you, and th that's the day that it happens. So that's what we've got here. So we're looking here. What's the next chart here? Um, the fifty-year decline in wages. So share of gross domestic income compensation to employment. So this is from Fred. You can see very clearly from nineteen seventy-one all the way down. And I've shared on webinars, um, you know, charts from Australia talking about 
our monetary supply and recessions and interest rates and all these things overlapping over the years. But this is just a nice little website. Um, so we look at what have we got? Income share top 1% relative to the bottom of 90%. Oh, where are we? Here we go. Let's look at more of them here. Real GDP versus the median male income. So if we look at real GDP, GDP's kept going, going up, but the male income just stayed stagnant. It should have grown up like it did beforehand. Uh, real GDP uh, per capita and medium female income. So that's grown because they've had to now go and enslave the wife to go and work. You've now got not only, you know, back in the day, a husband could afford to go and feed the family and look after the kids and all that, and the wife could stay at home and be a good housewife. And I might get in trouble for saying that, but I'm just saying what's factual. But now you need to have both the husband and the wife uh, working and they build new financial products and you look at what they've been able to do they've created childcare rebates and certain things like that this created a whole new industry and they're like well we'll just get the wife to go and package up the kid and send the kid off to childcare as soon as it's born and we'll subsidize that and get the wife to have to go and pay for things um, if you have a look at this you've now seen the spread between dual income working couples so we've now got both spouses working 66 percent it used to be what was that back in 1970 it was like 47 it was a 50 let's say it's a 50 50 split before and now it's a uh you know a bigger gap like you've got if you think about both people working and let's say that they're both a husband and a wife in a relationship you've got both people in a relationship 66 percent but then you look at the women that are working and you've only got 7% of women that are working. You add 7% on top of 66, that's like 73% of female participation in, in, in the workforce. And that's not saying you know of anything about women. It's just saying that now you have to have both two people working in a household. Um, have a look here. What's this, what's this last one here? The, the inequality rates. And you can see that for a long period of time it was pretty stable it was pretty stable but then when 1971 came it's just been on the on the increase and the reason being is just due to the, the fact that they're printing out more and more money net worth so what have we got here we've got here um you can see the inversion here you can see the inversion of us net worth we're going to have a look at the cost of living. I think everyone's seen this one here before, but a new house, 25K in 1971, an average income, 10 grand a year. So an income now might be 50 grand a year, 80 grand a year, whatever the income rate is, but a house isn't 200 grand. A house is a million bucks, one and a half million. A car, three grand for a car. It would cost you three months to save up a car. A car now is 80 grand, 100 grand. That's an annual wage just for a car. The average went 150 bucks a month. That keeps increasing. Harvard University, 2,600 per year. A movie ticket, dollar fifty. I don't even know what a movie ticket cost. Um, gas, four bucks now. I'd imagine now eight bucks now a gallon. So that's gone up twenty times. Postage stamp, I don't know, a buck or something. It's interesting to see things that have faded away. It gets a lot lot more interesting right so this here is the unit price per can of Campbell's condensed tomato soup so you know a can of shitty soup right like something out of the depression it was flat for 100 years when was it started up there 1895 there's like 80 years that it was flat and then 1971 came where the arrow is and suddenly the cost has gone up. So the cost was 10 cents beforehand. It was 10 cents. That flat line was at 10 cents. It's now based here in 2020. This is in US at a dollar. So it's gone up 10 times. But that 10 times has gone up over 50 years. That's straight line. And you can see that this straight line, it was a bit flatter. If you were to draw lines, right? And this is what you draw lines on anything. Like, fortunate enough, I've got a ruler here and I found myself a highlighter. So let's draw on these charts so we can start piecing it together, right? 
And I'll show you where the hyperinflation will come in. Right? And this is just simple mathematics, right? And fundamentals of the world we live in. Let's just draw that, right? There's three parts here. You've got the flat line. Didn't do much, who cares? Then we started seeing up to about 2010 what happened over that period of time. They printed money, but when the GFC came, they had to print a lot more money. Right? So each time, it's getting straighter and straighter and straighter. So it shows that the level of that compounding effect of the inflation is gaining momentum much faster than ever before. And if we would have put this into the next, you know, five years or 10 years, I expect it to look something like that, which would be even straighter, until it looks like something like this, which is where our hyperinflation will fit, right? And people might think, you know, Birch, he's off his head, go get on his meds, whatever the case may be, right? But I'm just researching things, guys. I'm just researching things here. I've been putting data like this. I like this website. This is a website called WTF happened in 1971. So um, don't go to it now because otherwise you probably lose me on your device. But just something to go and revert to a little bit later. So if we look at um, cumulative inflation 1913 to, nine, uh, to 2015, if we were to add this up and put in from more recent times, look at this inflation levels. It was pretty flat, it had bits of inflation here. And then it's just compounded, bang, 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 bang. But if you look at inflation over the course of, um, I wonder why it was sticky, there was a, a hair tie on my, um, on my thing. But if we look at inflation, I'm sure that of more recent years, the inflation would look more like that. This is what inflation looked like before any of you even knew what inflation was. <laughs> this is what inflation looked like beforehand. And now we know what inflation is, how hockey stick is that getting? That's going to become hockey stick. That's going to end the hyperinflation. Consumer price index in the United States, 1775 to 2012, right? And let's just think about this. This is way before... What's going on on my phone here? Someone's trying to request something of that. Um, here's the CPI, right? CPI. Um, from 1775, so 200 years, right? Yeah, come up here. Let's just highlight some certain points that have occurred, right? So we've got we've got here Revolutionary War on the end in 1775, the War of 1812, which is the second one, Civil War in 1865. Then we turn the century at World War One, World War Two, and up to 2012 here. So very, very important to look here, right? You go through little phases, right? And these phases last for about 50 years, right? Boom, 50 years, boom, 50 years. And it's all always ended in a level of inflation, right? You can see like a, a high level of inflation has occurred just before it flattens off again and comes back. But in this one here, we started the Industrial Revolution and then we changed our currency. And ever since that occurred, inflation has run rampant. And this, if you overlay it over currency that's been created over that 200 years, there's more currency. Take this out of perspective. This only gets to 2012. But in the last 24 months, there's been more currency printed than what there was for 200 years combined in the last two years. So when you start laying this data over, what significantly changed at that period of time? Bureau of Labor of Statistics, Historical Statistics of the United States, uh, electric, Electricity, Food, Fruit, CPI. And this is called the CP lie, right? Because they say it's a CPI, but the reality of it is, is that back in 1971, they were quoting on like a piece of fucking steak that would be like, you'd call it Wagyu now. They'd be like, oh yeah, a piece of Wagyu, right? It's like, no, that was a piece of steak beforehand. When they class meat, they're putting fucking dog food into the equation, basically now. They used to say housing. They put housing into this. Now they say housing is the affordability to pay rent. It's not the cost of a house in Sydney or a cost of a house somewhere. You have a look at it. 
everything went off the, the, the wayside. It was straight line up until 1971, and it's just getting worse and worse. So the highest one is fruit. Fruit is going up. And what do they do? They're controlling the farms now, right? And then they're trying to control the food and the electricity. So they're all tied in together. So when we start seeing, and we just think about it, right? We go and read the news articles and you go, okay, the electricity, here we've got the electricity price, right? The red one is electricity. No, no, sorry. The green one is electricity, right? So imagine you've seen it here. The green one is your electricity on the bottom going up. What's that naturally going to do? It means that the food goes up and it means that the fruit goes up and everything rises with that. So as we're starting to see this inflation roll through, it's uncontrollable. They have a Ponzi scheme and it's broken and it has to come home to roost, which is via hyperinflation. Let's just keep going through. Oh, you're a smart cookie. You're an investor. You're a property investor in Australia. You must have bought a house 10 years ago, right? And um, I think to myself, like all the people who've gone, oh, wow, you must have been smart. You know, how did you know Western Sydney was going to go off? I was buying shit in Western Sydney unreally, unknowingly to the extent of the level of manipulation due to inflation and currency and the things that support it. I could sit here and say, I'm the best property investor in the world, blah, blah. But reality of it is, it's that it's not about what I'm buying as a property. It's just that I own the asset and it's the inflation has done its thing. So here we are looking at median house prices in New York is the blue line. Median household income in New York is the red line. Median house price in Boston is the yellow line. Median household income in Boston is the gray line. And when you look at that data, you can see that it's not just the housing that's gone up in Australia, in Sydney, in anywhere, every housing around the world would have the charts of them going through the roof. But then the income has stayed pretty stagnant. What has occurred, which is different here, is they've controlled how currency is created. They've allowed people to go from a 50% loan down to a 5% loan. They've allowed for interest rates to come down from 10% down to 2%. And it's control of that currency, which has allowed the wages to stay low and everyone to become more and more indebted. And that debt creation is creating hyperinflation to the assets that they own, which is really, really cool. So the reality of it is, is to get onto assets. Here's one here. Um, Australia's total mortgage repayments percentage-wise versus the household income over 25 years. So we look at it here, and we've got the red is Sydney, the green is Melbourne, the blue is Australia as a whole. Why did it start going up at that period of point? Because it's been manipulated. How long does it take to save for a house? All right, we're all property investors here. We've got here... In 19, what was it? 1950, it was 2.3 uh, years, 2.6, 2.4. And then after 1970, in 1980, it was 3.8, 5.4, 7. And this only goes up to 2020, right? That's probably doubled in the last 12 months, 24 months. We're going to have a look here. Home value change versus income change. Everyone goes, oh, well, wages used to be high or whatever the case may be. It's the manipulation of the currency. And when you're going to have a turnover in this side, this is where the fun starts, right? The US gold reserve versus the gold price. Who knows how much gold they've got? So they've had gold going up and down, like the amount of level of gold. And they're saying that they've never bought gold ever since 1971. So right there is 1971. It's just been flatlined. But then you see the price of gold has gone all the way through the roof and just keeps going up. Why? Because it's inflated. Hyperinflation episode. So we have a look here between 1971 and 1966. So this is um, this one here would be an interesting stat to look at uh, moving forward. So where that arrow is with that graph, it's between 1971 and 1996. So that blue box there is uh, about 20 five years that that period 
Um, so we can see that there's been more and more countries that was not hyperinflation before this period. If there was, those countries went into hyperinflation because they were shit or whatever. So let's look at a few of those countries that went into hyperinflation. In 1936, 1916 to 1921, Austria went into hyperinflation. Um, free city of Dzing, it doesn't even exist anymore, went into hyperinflation. Germany went into hyperinflation with uh, Hitler. Hungary went into hyperinflation. Poland went into hyperinflation. And Russia went into hyperinflation. In 1941 to 1946, uh, Greece, Hungary, uh, China, Taiwan, and the Philippines all went into hyperinflation. So when you go to a third world country or a country that has, you know, you go and buy a hamburger and it costs you 500,000 whatever currency they're using, that's because the currency has been destroyed. Then you look here and you've got Chile it was the first one to go in. Right? And then basically every country between 1991, 1996, Belarus, Bosnia, Bulgaria, Estonia, uh, Lithu Latvia, Lithuania, Moldova, uh, Poland, Republic something or other, can't pronounce it, Russia, Ukraine, Yugoslavia, Armenia, um, all these countries, you can see them, right? How many countries are going to lose their currency? No one's lost their currency afterwards. We think when we look at places like Venezuela, which, and then you've got Zimbabwe, right? So the two hyperinflations that have occurred of recent decades, right? And we laugh and go, oh, Venezuela, you know, ha, ha, ha. Zimbabwe, ha, ha, ha. Their currency's worth nothing, right? They're the only two that's happened for the last 30 years. But here, all these currencies got KO'd because of hyperinflation. What's going to happen when they are forced to print more currency, right? That's what I'm looking at. That's the important part. That's the money shot. We're now coming up to a point where this is not sustainable. So, interesting times. Um, here's, a, here's interesting. Occurrence of Google peer, re, peer, of peer review in Google Books from 1971. So the reference of peer review. So how they gauging things, how they are um, uh, assessing things is very, very different. Uh, currency crashes. Um, here we go. Median. Actually, going back to this one here, I just want to go back to hyperinflation because something very important. You might be wondering why it's yellow and red and different sort of colors in the, in the chart, right? So I'll read them to you. The red is, so the, the, the color is the time for price to double, right? Really, really important. The time for price to double is red, orange, or yellow. Red is the worst, and then yellow is less. The time for price to double in the red is hours, right? Hours, not weeks or days or months, right? So imagine you go in and, you know, I read an article the other day, that Maccas, everyone's got the shits because Maccas, their burgers have gone up by 25 to 35%. It's a Daily Mail article. Go and read it. I put it in the Birch feed the other day. Um, people have got the shits because Maccas prices have gone up by 30% on average in the last 12 months. So if you think about that, your Big Mac, your cheeseburger, a cheeseburger now is $4.15 for a fucking cheeseburger, right? You can go to the local hamburger shop. I don't know what they cost over there anymore, but... You know, the cost has gone up dramatically, right? And um, looking at the, um, that took a year for it to go up by 30%. No one's even realized the level of inflation that has occurred yet. You're starting to see it through your food. You're starting to see it through your grocery, right? But the red one doubled in the hours, right? So you go in this morning and I don't like promoting things. That's why I don't wear stuff on there. You can probably guess what the water is. With a bottle of water, that's like four bucks or whatever, right? For the bottle of water. Um, imagine you go in and buy that, and it's eight dollars tomorrow, 
Right? It's just overnight, it's gone up eight bucks from four bucks. And then uh, two days later, it's now $20. And then on next week, it's $200 for a bottle of water, right? Literally hours in these countries that are in the red, it took to double, right? So then the orangey color one is days. So it might double from $4 this week to $8 by the weekend and twenty dollars by next weekend, and then the yellow one, which is the oh, it's not so bad, right? It takes weeks to double. So this week it's four, next week it's eight, the week after it's ten, the week after that it's twenty weeks that it took. They're just some hyperinflations that you've seen in recent times. We haven't seen as many, but wait until we start seeing these currencies imploding. They're falling apart. It's like they're taped together with duct tape. That's literally the system that we're in right now. It's going to have a sip of the water. Imagine going back to 1960 and saying that I could go and trade this bottle to 10 cents. They go, water? You, you bought water for four bucks? right? And say, I can get 10 cents. They're like, I bought a case of Coca-Cola for 10 cents. Whatever the case may be, right? The, the bottle's worth more than the ingredients in the future. Uh, all we're seeing with the hyperinflation is that we're going to see 50 years of inflation squirted into 12 months, 24 months, and really high levels of inflation. And once the currency implodes upon itself, that's when we end in the hyperinflation. If we look at currency crashes. The amount of currency crashes that have occurred um, over the course of the last 30 years. So 1971, there was no such thing as a currency crash. But then we started seeing heaps of currency crashes. There's less and less of them nowadays. But what happens when they start losing control? Um, all major currencies have depreciated over the past century relative to gold. So if you just compare it to gold standard, um, the value of it has lost. Yeah. Those currencies are gold, US dollars. So gold is still what gold is, an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold. Um, the Deutsche Mark lost their value here. Um, is the, the longest reigning one. Um, but they're all worthless down here. You can see that the value has fallen off. The value has fallen off at that period of time. Now everything's in line. So when you start seeing less and less currency crashes, it's because they're all in one line. They're all dead anyway. When you see a straight line on something, it's life support, it's dead. This is the fun one, right? This is the fun one. This here um, is the number of countries with banking crises. This is only up until 2000, guys. Only up until 2000. There was no banking crises here. There were banks going broke before there were such things in place. But then when it came off the gold standard, there was many, many banks that were failing, which are from bank runs. If you think about it, we're living in a digital world. If you can't go and get access to your cash, the money was never yours. So you can't have a bank run if you can't go to the bank and take it out. Right? Federal debt. Right? If you have a look at it, the amount of debt that is growing every year, they're anticipating in 2050 for it to go straight through the roof. Actually, we're here at the moment. Right? We're here. I don't know if you can see the dotted line in the middle of it here. The amount of debt that's been created more than world war ii more than all the everything combined and that's without a hyperinflation this one here is uh gross federal debt held by the public percentage of gdp it's a big it's a big jump at that period and just keeps getting higher this one puts it into a different perspective, right? And I said beforehand, with the levels of inflation, you, you start to see it like this, and then went like this, and now it's kind of like this. If you wait for it, because I have to pull this chart all the way back, right? <laughs> Look at that, right? Look at that. Let's zoom in and see what it is. So this is US national debt, 1900 to 2020. So this is 120 years. All the money that's being created, the governments have in debt. It was flat. It was nothing in the earlier years, up until 1940s. The wars, 
Who gives a shit? They got us to 1970. But after 1970, and overlay this with recessions, right? we can sit, see where it is there at the top of the thing. That's in 2000, the Y2K bug, September 11, whatever. And then they had to print more. Go out a bit further. And then after the GFC, we had to print that. It's literally straight up. It's literally, it's going to be like this. This is what it's going to look like moving forward. I didn't plan to have a a ruler here. I just found a ruler on my desk so I can colour it in, right? But we're literally going to see it. I'm just trying to draw it to put in the perspective. It's off the chart, right? We're literally just going to see it straight up. It's getting thinner and thinner, right? And the more that this happens, the less your debt is, the less your money's worth, right? Your money's worthless. So if you have assets and you take it through these periods, that's where the value is. That's where the rich get richer, the wealthy get wealthy. You don't have to be a rich person to get started. You just need to understand the concept of money doesn't exist. The concept that it's all created from nowhere. And then realize that the assets are the real thing, right? I know that if all the money disappears, a highlighter is still one highlighter. A pen is still one pen. The ruler is still one ruler. The duster is just still one duster. Um, the money could be whatever it is. This could be worth $5 trillion, but a trillion dollars means nothing. That doesn't mean shit. So here we go, looking at some more charts. What happened in 1971? Uh, these lines are the external dollar liabilities and the official external dollar liability. So the basically the debts have risen, but they were rising at a very slow pace. But when it got unpegged from the gold standard went straight through the roof <clears throat> here's the u.s federal debt surplus versus gdp if it's surplus it'll be above the line if it's a gdp it's below the line it was never really under the only time it was under due to two wars but it hasn't been able to ever become over the top apart from the only time it did become uh over the line is here in the 1990s and if we overlay that let's just draw a line here sorry the so only time it went over was in 2000 early 2000 late 90s early 2000 what was that it was the dot-com bubble so any time it ever went over um, these charts are not made up you can go check out the charts on whatever platform Fiscal year, U.S. commercial bank assets of the U.S. government's Federal Reserve. So the asset of the Federal Reserve is not oh, their own property. The assets of the Federal Reserve are the debts that they have out there, which are the, the assets of the, of the bank, of the Federal Reserve. Um, here we've got the S&P ratio. Um, you can see it since then. Just keeps going up why does it keep going up all these experts oh i'm the bitcoin guy i'm the you know everything's going up it's gone up because the money's lost its value price to earning ratio working hours to buy the s p 500 so this is a convergence of data using um you know the amount of money that you earn per hour versus the increase in the s p it just shows it's a debt-based fueled orgy of a system. Um, here you go, speculation versus production. So the actual industrial production of any goods. Um, how do we show this? So the industrial production is this one here, and the volume of future trading is this one here. So these are paper contracts, which is putting value out there, versus real production, which is there. Market capitalization by sector. Some sectors have gone up, financial markets gone up, resources have gone down, others have gone down. <laughs> this one here is a fun one. The savings rate. So in 1970, in before 1971, everyone used to save. It was a a different type of currency. People were incentivized by being able to save because they weren't just keep printing money. 
But afterwards, the debt was cheaper than borrowing. When the GFC came, no one had credit, so that's why there was that little blip there. And ever since then, it's been going backwards. Um, what's the next one here? Net savings as a percentage of national income. Savings rates declining. Um, There's a trade balance. So the balance... The US, the US trade balance, right? Look at 1971 here. Where is it? There we go. I'm looking this from behind. It's always been ever since. Um, US goods trade balance. Cost of a barrel of oil in nominal terms. <laughs> uh, we have the bit where it flicked off the chart was when Corona occurred. But uh, as we can see in recent times, this isn't up to date. It's much higher than what it ever was. The the dollar standard that's backed by the, the they call it the petrodollar, which is backed by oil, um, as only works if it's in a range of around a hundred bucks, under a hundred bucks. If it goes over a hundred dollars, then there's an issue. So it has to play within a range. I'll draw a little range here, right? Um, plays between one hundred twenty bucks. Let's say. 80 bucks. Currency loses its value if it goes outside of that band. Um, obviously, it fell off a cliff in 2020, so that's an anomaly there. But if we look at it now, we're looking at 120, 140, 180, 200 bucks a barrel. Well, we can see that it's heading in one direction. So this currency is killing itself based on what it's backed in, which is oil, because the value of the oil is going up, which it can't sustain at a value over a hundred bucks. Um, interest rates tw since... <laughs> oh, look at this. You want to think about interest rates. All the people are out there that are watching the news and going, oh, interest rates are going to go up. Oh, I'm so scared. What about 20% interest rates? All people are fixated on is a glitch in the matrix, right? This is really fucking important, this one. This one is so fucking important. Can't even explain, right? This here is interest rates since 3000 BC. So 3000 years before Jesus walked the earth, right, is where this chart has come from. Right, and at that point, um, short-term rates. There was only short-term rates back then, which equaled between um, four percent and twenty percent. So four percent and twenty percent is the upper and lower end of the rates. Three thousand fucking uh, five thousand years ago, three thousand BC, five thousand years ago. Right, you can start seeing the picture. They weren't below four percent. Right, if they go below four percent, certain things happen. Right, anyway, it laid there but never went up high. But then we have a look at that small blip. Everyone goes, Oh, it's going to go back to 20 percent or 15 percent or whatever the case was back in the early 1990s, late 80s. That's a blip out of the system. You've got to take that off the occasion as well. But since 1971. What's been happening with interest rates? They've gone to the lowest levels you've ever seen, right? These are all artificial. The whole market is artificial. That's why we've got such great growth. It's amazing. What have we got here? <laughs> when you go and speak to your financial advisor and they say, go and buy some bonds, right? Go get some bonds. It's very, very good investment, right? In 1971, you had the bond market. It was pretty stable. They were a very safe thing. But then we've seen them go up, which looked great, but then they've come back down. And the bond market's dead because it's backed on what interest rates are. Energy consumption per capita in the US, uh, one kilowatt, of course, equals, yeah. More and more devices, more and more people connected, more and pe more people needing to spend money on electricity. If you've got rising electricity costs and you've got less and less resources, that's now causing another convergence that's occurring. Um, yeah, very, very interesting um, chart there. Um, energy versus GDP. You've seen where people's mindsets have changed between 
using like Liberal and Labor and um, Democrats and Republicans and all that. Put it there. Look at what happened. Look at what happened. Let's see how we get people like Trump elected. What happened? What happened to the world? What happened? It's not based on the money that we use. Look at the number of pages in the Federal Register. This is last one here. Yeah. There's lots and lots of charts here. I could be here all night, right? This is last one. Number of lawyers per population of lawyer. The number of physics in... Uh, in what was it here? PhDs conferred in the US 1900 through to 2012. Um, in 1971, what happened? Incarceration of inmates incarcerated under state and federal jurisdictions. The jail system is a business in itself. Not a business that I've looked into, but it's, uh, it's a business within itself. The most scariest one's coming up very shortly. It's not the divorce rate, right? Look at the divorce rates. Why are people getting divorced? Because it's easier to get divorced, because it's breaking down of the family unit, is control of population and how you know how they can control people. But this one here is the interesting one, right? Percentage, um, I mean, that's not it. This is showing that unwedded women having kids. This one, the next one, is the very important one. The children per woman, right? The children per woman. Since 1971, 1950s, right? The breakdown of the family unit. Husband and wife can't have a kid anymore because they've got to go back to work. They've got to have two household working people in the household. We've now, in 1971, gone from five down to two and a half kids per house, per woman, per woman, should we say. That's not saying that you need to get two women now to get the same family. It's all mathematics, though. Trends in obesity. Uh, look at the, the trends in obesity. Why did we start getting obese at that period of time? Because the food changed, the chemicals that they put into the food. What's this next one here? Health expenditure has gone up due to the fact that the, the, the food is bad, the stuff that we're feeding ourselves, the junk, the chemicals that we're putting in our body. Meat consumption. Meat consumption. So if you look at the amount of meat, chicken has gone up a lot more. Why did chicken? Because it's easier. It's a little bird. They can fill it full of chemicals. They make those. You go to KFC, you get, oh, I'll have the breast piece of chicken, please. And it's like the size of your palm. Well, I've got a big palm, but like people's palm, it's what I'd expect a chicken nugget to look like. It's the size of the base of the bottle there we go the size of the base of the bottle and you got two chicken breasts <laughs> come on interesting interesting times go check out the site it's called wtf happened in 1971 gonna go down to your messages and comments here um and read it so i've got all these pop-ups hopping on my screen um here we go um so what question we got this is why models business uh, um this is the information i like to hear good financial learning with the monetary system thanks jonathan appreciate that the information is out there i try to share it with you guys i get very jovial with um all of the the things that i, I post up and um and uh and you know the news that I throw around on a weekly basis, but there, it is backed by statistics. I've researched this a lot. I find this stuff exciting, but I've seen it all beforehand, but I think a lot of people haven't seen it. That's why I wanted to get it um, online tonight because I thought a lot of people might enjoy this. So uh, Ali, this is epic, thanks. Uh, Brooke said inflation is devaluing the value of the fiat currency, exactly. Um, Nate says, I buy houses and rent that to most people can afford. Um, Andrea says here, 
cheeseburgers cheaper if you buy the cheese and slice separately exactly exactly but it's uh those burgers are too expensive now as well but on that note guys if you got any questions drop them below um uh i'll post the articles onto uh, birch feed later on tonight so you can uh, have a look through them and go through the data yourself um, but a lot of changes happened in 1971 it's a very um, it's a very interesting time back then which I wasn't here obviously but when you look at what has happened what caused certain things to occur we're going to be looking back in 10 years time in 20 years time in 30 years time and we'll be able to see certain things that have occurred in charts and graphs and statistics and reflect back on them and say hey hang on a second in 2020 this occurred in 2021 this occurred in 2025 this occurred in 2030 that occurred i remember when you know this had they pushed a button they did this and you said that this is what happened and you can start seeing you know this is saying i think it's like maybe a biblical saying it's like a blind man may see what a sighted man may not and um i could read the news just like braille because i'm seeing so many inconsistencies not backed on facts and uh we're going to be able to look back and if you're wise enough and you equip yourself and you've got an open mind uh, the world is designed in a way that you have a closed mind you obey what, without questioning and um you know that's the system that we're sitting in and um if you've got an open mind and you can start looking at this data understanding if they pull this and this occurs if they pull that lever if they turn this direction that's what happened over here um you'll have the best chance of being able to take advantage of the opportunities out there you're aware of it you're awake of it you're in sync with it um, and you don't freak out i'm very optimistic everyone is going oh interest rates oh interest rate this whatever the car i don't give a shit right get out of here interest rates over a year over two years of my investing i've been investing for 20 years you think they're going to get scared about interest rates i remember paying fixing my interest rates at nine percent because i was scared because people put shit in my ear oh interest rates will go 20 percent, whatever so you know i've seen all interest rates much higher than what they are today but the fundamentals are very solid um there's a sound strategy behind what i do and what i invest in and I'm very optimistic because I see that two years is a blip, right? It's what comes after that and what is the outcome of the actions, the choices that are being decided for us and put in place. So um, just be mindful of the actions that you take because there's lots of, you know, positive and negatives that come, come from that. Um, Sam asks, would it be ideal to have less debt towards the end of the hyperinflation? Uh, of course, uh, I want to take as much debt through the hyperinflation or... Uh, Beside taking so much debt through, taking through as much asset as I can to get hyperinflated, I want to have as much asset to be cash flow hyperinflated as well, and then take that cash flow and then just pay out all the debt. There'll be a point when I'll be like, "Hey, I'm paying out debt because I um I don't yeah you know, I don't see it going any further." And that takes me on to Matt's point and question here. So Matt just said the 30-day interbank transfer is down to 3.6 from 4%. So all these interest rates, people um, people are sitting here going, oh, interest rates could go up higher. It's, the economists are saying they're going up higher, all these sort of things. Uh, there's only parameters of where they can hit before it shits itself. If we go back to that chart of the oil, let's look at the oil for a second, right? Let's look at the oil. Let's look at oil. Where's oil? Come here, oil. Come here, oily, oily. Where are you? Where's the oil? Here we go back to the oil chart right we're sitting here and most people are like oh well you know um, i'm just trying to see where i'm showing this on the screen if we look at the oil chart there was a glitch here it went under right but it was heading in a direction right it's heading in a direction and it's back up here right so if we look at this oil i'm just going to do some drawing right There we go. There's an up-to-date chart. There's our oil, right? The carol, cost of the barrel of oil. So it went all the way down. It's the first time it ever went down negative, right? How can a bottle of barrel of oil? People weren't paying people to take oil away, right? It was just fake contracts. It's fake money. It's a fake world that we're living in here. But anyway, fake information. Right? I think Robert Kiyosaki wrote a book. I've never read it, but it's called Fake. It's like, it talks about all this stuff. Um, 
but now the cost of oil is back up in line with that trend line, but it's, you know, it went under for a little bit. So then if we think that's what could happen with a barrel of oil and it was a glitch, no one remembers getting oil at negative 50 bucks a barrel or whatever in February 2020 when the whole market's turned to shit and they had to go and print their way through this. All they know is oil at, you know, this. Why is oil at 200 bucks a barrel? The oil's at 200 bucks a barrel because of all this manipulation that's occurred prior to this. Um, so when we look at that and when you go and have a look at interest rates, I think the interest rates um, page, wherever that was, um, I don't have the interest rates, it's somewhere there. There's too many charts. If we look at the fact that if the oil price could go like that and have inconsistency, what will happen with your interest rates? What will happen in the longer term trend? And that's what I'm concerned about. And for me, I'm very optimistic by that because I can see that it's on a trend line, not going up, it's on the way down. The only way for this system to survive is for it to keep going negative and i believe that we will see negative interest rates i'm still very confident just remember that this is probably the only person in the country right it sounds like an absolute idiot to a lot of people out there saying that interest rates will i'm 90 percent confident that they'll go negative um, if not they'll come back down to their zero point barrier so um, and that's where matt just wrote here that the 30-day interbank um, cash rate futures is now sitting at 3.6 it was at 4% before him because even on the the ASX site which is predicting the futures of where the bond yields are going that's coming off a top it's gone up and it's starting to come back down and head back in its different direction so um, something to keep an eye out there Tom said what year do you think hyperinflation will start in um, hyperinflation uh, has started but it's not hyperinflation at the moment it's just a very high level of inflation um, if the rules that be um, uh, don't be careful with how they're manipulating um, sort of the currency that's out there and the control of the capital that's in the system, um, they're going to cause a massive deflation, which they're going to have to then re-stimulate the market and then that will cause the hyperinflation. So I believe probably two years, three years after this deflationary cycle, they've got no other option but to print their way through this, which will inevitably end up in hyperinflation. So I'm very, very excited and very optimistic by that. On that note, folks, I uh, just want to thank you for tuning in, spending an hour and 20 minutes of your evening with me. Uh, if you need help with anything, uh, reach out to my office, uh, 1-300-367-925. Email us, admin at beinvested.com.au. Um, you can uh, send us a direct message on here. Be careful if people are messaging you out of the blue. I won't be adding you as a friend. Be invested will not be giving away Bitcoin to people. There's a lot of scammers out there on all different sites and all different people trying to trap them. So just be mindful of scammers out there. Message us on our appropriate channels. Um, I've got a team of experts here. I've got over 100 people in the Be Invested head office uh, to help uh, guide you guys uh, on your journey, whether it be finance, whether it be managing your assets, whether it be you know accounting, whether it be uh, legal stuff, whatever you need help with. Uh, if you need help with accumulating assets, where I help my investors is building strategy to not just you know get through this cycle, but to capitalize on the market that we've got, uh, identifying assets, uh, purchasing the assets via a buyer's agency. I am one of the first buyer's agents that existed in this country. Nowadays, you can go and find buyer's agents everywhere that have been you know driving cabs two years ago or doing something different, and now they're an expert in property. Um, I've been doing this for nearly 20 years. I've got uh, tens of millions of dollars worth of debt, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of assets. And um, I help people uh, build wealth using property as a primary vehicle. So if you need help, I can help you locate, negotiate, and uh, you know get the strategy right on building out that property portfolio. So um, reach out to my team. They'll put you in contact with me uh, or to the relevant department that you need to speak to. So um, thanks a lot for watching. Uh, if you like the content, give us a like, share it with your friends, tag all your friends and family in it. Um, until next week, I'll see you next Tuesday. Bye for now.